Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, chairpersons. Uh, thank you, Inazal and Dr. Duseja and his team for having me here. If you look at the evolution of systemic therapies, these are the pivotal trials which have taken place. The ones in green are the one which were positive trials. The ones in the red <coughs> were negative trials. And the ones in blue <coughs> were conditionally positive. So if you see sorafenib, nivolumab, lenvatinib, atizobev, and durvatrimi, these have been the ones which are singularly positive. And these are all the targets which are there. We are aware that many of these drugs target more than one receptors. For example, lenvatinib, it will target FGFR, PDGFR, VEGFR, and KIT. On the other hand, cabozantinib will target the MET, KIT, VEGFR. You have the PDL1 targeted by the Etizo, Durva, and then AV, the PD1, Nivolumab, Pembro, Tizlezumab, and Kemlezumab. So there are different receptors with different drugs. The ones in STAR are already approved and found to be effective. The ones which are not star are in different phases of trials. So these are the molecules that you can be talking about for the next 10 years or so. Coming back to the BCLC staging, uh, if you look at the BCLC, for advanced stage, you are talking of systemic therapy and for a subgroup of the intermediate stage, which is the diffuse infiltrative extensive bilobar involvement, the systemic therapy becomes the treatment of choice. Which is the systemic therapy of choice? Etizobev or Durvatremi. If not feasible, sorafenib or lenvatinib or Durva alone. And second line would be post-sorafenib, Rigora, Cabo or Remu if the AFP is more than 400. post etizobev, post durva tremi, and post lenva or Durva, this recommend clinical trials. So this was the first study, the SELECT trial for lenvatinib, which showed that it was superior to the placebo. If you have to choose between lenvatinib and sorafenib, this was a study published by Kudo in Lancet 2018, where lenvatinib had a, a slightly better uh, profile, especially in terms of the progression-free survival and time to progression as compared to sorafenib. More importantly, the adverse events were much lesser with lenvatinib as compared to sorafenib, and this has been reflected in the clinical experience as well. And therefore, today, lenvatinib is preferred over sorafenib as first-line therapy by most people who treat HCC. Few words which are rarely discussed when we talk of lenvatinib. What is to be monitored when you start these patients on lenvatinib? Blood pressure, urine analysis for proteinuria, serum calcium levels, thyroid hormone levels, and cardiac functions. The most common side effect is hypertension. And the hypertension has to be managed aggressively to prevent complications. Another feature which you have to keep in mind in response to lenvatinib is the depth of response. So it is the percentage of tumor shrinkage based on longest diameter or reconstructed volume observed at the lowest point compared with the baseline. And if you look at the data with lenvatinib, the depth of response is associated with sustained response and sustained benefit. And this is extremely important. So the better the depth of response, more is the survival of the patient, not only progression-free survival, but also the post-progression survival is superior in those patients who have a higher depth of response. Cabozantinib is something which is rarely discussed, but it is a drug which has been found in patients with advanced and uh, drug resistant, the, the HCC which is resistant to lenvatinib or uh, sorafenib. So this was the pivotal study published in NEGM, which showed a improvement in median overall survival with comparable uh, adverse events to most other drugs. Of course, then we had the etizobev. This was the, the seminal trial which showed 
uh, not only overall survival benefit with atezolizumab as compared to sorafenib, the survival of progression free survival of 6.8 months as compared to 4.3 months with sorafenib. So this was the study design. One is to one randomization of 501 patients, better overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.58. Progression free survival was also better with a hazard ratio of 0.59. The adverse events were much lower. It happened in around uh, more than 10 percent in either arm. But if you see the major side effects were much lesser in patients with atezolizumab. Uh, the significant side effects with sorafenib which were not there with atezolizumab were diarrhea, uh, anorexia and the ones which were more with atezolizumab were increase in ALT, proteinuria and infusion related reactions. The quality of life was better with atezolizumab. Then we had the TREMI plus DURVA in unreceptable HCC. This was a trial published in NEGM evidence and it showed improvement in the median progression free survival. The response was much better with the stride regimen as compared to the DURVA and the sorafenib arms. There was improvement in the time to deterioration of the global health status or quality of life. So again, another drug which improves not only survival, but also the quality of life. What are all the adverse events of these immune checkpoint inhibitors? Most of them, if you use NTPD1 plus CTLA4, are GI and skin. If you are giving only NTCTLA4, again, same GI and skin, but they come down. And if you use only PD1, the same side effects, but even lower than CTLA4. We have to be aware of an entity called as the hyperprogressive disease. Remember that the effect you get with immune checkpoint inhibitors is usually around 8 to 12 weeks after the initiation of therapy. So you do not expect a decline in the first 4 to 8 weeks. So do not expect a response in tumor markers or on imaging in the first four to eight weeks. If only after that you will start seeing a response. And in this period, there is a subgroup of patients who will have a rapid progression, what is called as the hyperprogressive disease, around 8 percent of patients. And this is similar to around 9 percent which has been reported in other tumors which have been treated with the immune therapy. We still do not know all the mechanisms for the same, but this is an entity which we have to be aware of and keep in mind when we treat our patients. So this is the inosal modification of the BCLC. Ashish and uh, the team have done a fantastic job. In fact, I can tell them that it was uh, conceived, these con thoughts were conceived even before the BCLC were published, where they subdivided the intermediates type into B1, B2 and B3. And for both B2, B3, as well as the stage C was divided into C1 and C2. The immunotherapy was considered as the treatment of choice. So for those patients who have a high intermediate stage with a high tumor burden, the concept has changed. Instead of starting with local renal therapy, then offering systemic therapy when the person is taste refractory or taste failure, you start off with the patients who are likely to be taste failure or taste refractory with systemic therapy and then you use local renal therapy with a curative intent. So if you change the sequence while utilizing both in patients who are at high risk for taste refractiveness, taste failure, you will be able to utilize taste better and give your patients better outcomes. There are other emerging goals of systemic therapy like in combination with ablative therapies, in combination with taste, excellent outcomes of synergy with <coughs> radio embolization and as downstaging and bridging therapy to liver transplant and the newer given therapy applied to liver resection. So the systemic therapies as given by the inosal guidelines are very similar to the BCLC. Now let us see what about the combination trials. Now they are being revisited 
with the immunotherapy, the LEAP-012, Checkmate, TASTE 3 and the Emerald one. So we just had a fantastic talk by Ashish on the tumor microenvironment. So if you have a cold tumor, you actually can make it hot and receptive to the systemic therapies by giving a local renal therapy. Unfortunately, we can't go into the details, but each of these local regional therapies has actually got a different mechanism for making a cold tumor hot. And this is what we need to understand when we decide for, based on our uh, findings, which therapy we are going to offer to our patients. So it should not only be the size, location, the liver function, but also the tumor microenvironment, which you have to keep in mind before you choose which local regional therapy you are going to offer. So MRL1 was the first, or is one of the recent trials which has shown a superiority of Durva plus Bevy plus TACE as compared to TACE alone with an improvement in the median progression free survival. Another study which showed TAIR plus nivolumab is uh, associated with more responses in almost 30% of the patients. Similarly, TAIR plus etizobev in patients with advanced HCC is shown to have superior results. Another study combining SBRT with etizobev in advanced stage HCC showing good results. Can we combine three monoclonal antibodies? We have been talking of two so far. So this is the result from the Morpheus liver study. Morpheus is a group of study for all uh, studies involving teragulumab. This was the Morpheus liver, open label multicenter randomized study which looked at Tira plus etizobev versus etizobev alone and there was an improvement in the investigator assessed progression free survival as per resist 1.1. Of course, this came at a cost of much higher adverse events with Tirago plus etizobev. So I think this is what our future therapy is going to look like. You are going to assess the microenvironment, you are going to assess the, doing the liquid biopsy, going to assess the histopathology with uh, immunohistochemistry and then you look at the various markers and accordingly you are going to choose which systemic therapy you are going to offer to your patients. Of course, we have to have, we have multiple tools and just like you require an integrated approach in managing your ground armed forces, Navy and Air Force and use them in the right sequence and in the right proportion to achieve victory. I think for HCC also, we have to use the multidisciplinary approach with multiple modalities that are now available to us in the right sequence and in an individualized manner to improve outcomes. And this was a study which actually showed that a multidisciplinary care is associated with improved outcomes. So take home points, my dear friends. Systemic therapy is the treatment of choice for advanced HCC and some intermediate. Lenva is now the preferred TKI over sorafenib. Etizobev plus Tremidurva is the first line uh, immunotherapy. Emerging role as bridging, downstaging and new adjuvant therapies. Exciting times for the systemic therapy and several new molecules and trials in the pipeline. So of course, we have the elephant, each one of us is looking at it, but I think you have to keep the condition of the liver at the center. So you have to look at it as a comprehensive approach and yet you have to look at it microscopically, look at the microenvironment before you take a decision. And this is where the hepatologist plays a very important role. The integrated care is the, the, the future and therefore all the disciplines have to come together to offer therapy to our patients to achieve good care. So on that note, thank you very much and I also take this opportunity to invite you to this Apazal single theme conference on improving non-transplant outcomes in patients with advanced liver diseases on the 7th, 8th and 9th February 2025 at Mumbai, India along with the Build 3.0 study. Thank you.